The king's been given a standing ovation after his speech to the German parliament. Charles said he wants the two countries to be involved in a restless pursuit of a better tomorrow. And we're just hearing that 10 days of strikes involving over 1,400 security officers at Heathrow Airport will go ahead as planned tomorrow. It's after final talks held today failed to resolve the current pay dispute. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed up 56 points at 76.20. The pound buys $1.23 and €1.13. LBC weather, blustery rain across Wales and southern and central England tonight. Drier further north and windy in the south with a low of 4 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Daryl Jackson. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation with Ian Dale. Hello, very good evening. It's three minutes past eight on LBC. Welcome to the show. If you've just joined us, you missed a cracking hour on electric cars there, but we're going to change the temperature now. And you know there's nothing I like more than a phone-in on mental health, and that's effectively what we're going to be doing over the next hour. But I'm always fascinated by people who change careers, who are well known for one thing, and then, for whatever reason, decide to go in a bit of a different direction. And that's what Sean Williams has done. Now, you'll know Sean from BBC Breakfast, Channel 5 News, many radio and television programmes, and she joins me in the studio now. Now, we talked last week. We recorded we an all, all Talk podcast, which yep. is going out next Wednesday. It's great fun. So I'm not going to cover all the ground that we covered there, but I do want to ask you, why did you decide, as one of the country's most well-known broadcasters, to veer off into becoming a psychologist? <laughs> Um, well, I think there is a similarity between broadcasting and psychology, which is storytelling. Uh, and I've been a journalist for 35 years. And you know what it's like it, when you're on a story and you're interested in a story, you're interested in hearing it from the human, the personal perspective. Um, and I think as a journalist, I started to th be a little concerned about making sure that I was really holding those stories properly. Because that's a huge responsibility, I think, when somebody is at the worst moment of their life, and they often are when you run into a traumatic news mm. story, people are struggling. Yeah. You need to really hold them quite carefully. They are entrusting you with their story and their voice. And when you have it, you've got to know how far to, to push with your questions, when to pull back, what to do with that story when you've got it. And I thought I wanted to know a bit more about the brain. So... Um, and also, I was seeing quite a few of my colleagues covering lots of different traumatic stories. And as a journalist, that's what you tend to do. You do tend to report on difficult and challenging events. And cumulatively, it can build up. And although journalists are very resilient, what might happen is that you start perhaps withdrawing or avoiding from certain activities if it all gets too much and you can't tell anyone about it. You don't want to say that you're struggling because, you know, what are your anxieties compared to the people you're reporting on? So when I started talking to journalists, I thought, you know, there's something here. We need to be a lot more open about mental health and well-being in our workplace. I trained as a trauma assessor. This is way back when, 15 years ago, I think, 18, can't remember. Then I did a, a master's in psychology and um, worked with journalists and, and published some academic research on post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic growth, recovery after trauma. And then about four or five years ago, I started a doctorate in counselling psychology and worked in the NHS. Spent a couple of years working with people with cancer, worked with families and complex trauma, worked with students at King's College in London. So I was really lucky really really lucky but it was the same sort of thing you know you're you're walking with somebody trying mm. to help them understand their own story and that's a great privilege uh, and it is therapy isn't it i mean it's it's uh, counseling yeah. therapy i don't know if, if if you think there's a difference between the two um and uh, it's very interesting what you said about knowing how far to push mm. and, and where to stop and I mean, doing a lot, a lot of mental health phone-ins on this station over the years. That that is that you're always thinking like that. Well, yes. okay, this is a really interesting story, but I don't want to make it worse for the individual by trying to get them to tell me things that actually they may not have intended to when they picked up the phone. Yeah, and and you because you are 
compassionate and empathetic and because you've been on the air for a long time what is it 10 years now 13 13 now yeah. um who'd have thought, who'd have thought? <laughs> <laughs> well of course you would have been on there for that length of time um listeners know you because they listen to you regularly and therefore when they know you they'll they'll want to confide in you and and i guess yes you do have to think I don't want to re-traumatise this person. But actually talking, even if it's quite a difficult listen, is incredibly important. This is why we have time to talk weeks. This is Mm. why people are always saying the best thing you can do is say it out loud. Because actually if you say it out loud to another person and that person looks at you and goes, you know what, that sounds really tough. That, That makes you think, Oh, so I'm okay feeling these feelings. Why, it why it do okay you think that people do still, even in 2023, internalise oh. everything? I do still think there's a stigma attached to it. Um, of and of weak, being perceived as weak? Being perceived, yeah. Being, but I think people worry that they will be perceived as weak. I think there's also a concern, and, and I can understand this, you know, So many people are going through so many difficult things at the moment. And there may be those who will think, I don't want to worry you any further by burdening you with my stuff. Mm. So I'll keep my stuff to myself. But it is, you know, a problem shared is a problem halved. And, And if you are struggling with somebody and you say to someone, I'm finding, I don't know, might be, who isn't, struggling with a cost of living crisis at the moment you know 80 percent a recent surveys 80 percent of people are uh, suffering from the mental health um, suffering from the financial health crisis and therefore that has an impact on mental health you know it is good to talk about this sort of stuff but it is still hard for for very many people I think is it also a generational thing where people from mm-hmm. our mother's generation yeah were just sort of so or well, just Get on with life. Yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. Can't sort of. I, I, I was just telling you before we started about the phoning we did on. I think it was Tuesday. Yeah. About David Jason discovering a long lost daughter that he never knew he had after fifty two years. It's amazing. And we did a phone in based on that. And I just asked people about their experiences. And we had a phone call. I think it was David in Manchester, if I remember right. Who I, mean, I can't remember his t- total story, but he. After his mother died, I mean, she had, on her deathbed, she had told him quite a lot of things, but what she hadn't told him, and I hope I've got the right caller here, Mm -hmm. um, was that he actually had two sisters or half-sisters, which he didn't know about. He didn't know that. And he said, my mother lived with that shame for, well, ever since she was a teenager and wasn't able to tell anyone about it. And it was just the most amazing story. And... Um, I think a lot of my listeners were really affected by that, but I think she was typical of her generation. Yes, and I think I think the post-war generation certainly hid a lot of things, mm. didn't feel they could express it, just because what they had already experienced, and because also so many people had gone through so much. Um, I remember my grandmother, quote, suffering from her nerves, you know, that was that was the thing. Oh, she suffers from her nerves. Nobody ever talked about it, but it, she was clearly struggling. But that wasn't something that anyone really referred to other than that phrase. No, and I can remember one of my cousins being described as, at school, having mental strain. Mental strain, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which could cover an could awful cover lot, of, a lot of things. I really. know, exactly. I do think it is shifting. I mean, certainly when I talk to to. to Journalists, for example, I do notice that the younger journalists are much more proactive when it comes to their mental health. And I think they're more aware of it, probably because they have a lot more access to social media and they are there are also a lot more pressures on them than perhaps there were for Mm. us. In all fairness, you know, in terms of financial pressures, in terms of student debt, buying a house and and all that sort of thing. So I I think they have become a lot more aware of their own mental health and well-being and and how to protect it. Um, But um, but I think for all generations, it's it's important to 
Well, we'll come to your call soon. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. If you want to talk to Sean, bit bit of free counselling maybe. I suppose. <laughs> um, I mean, whether you want to talk about trauma, PTSD, anxiety, grief, even, um, we'll happily take your calls. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. This phrase PTSD, I don't remember it occurring before the Falklands War. That that was my first sort of connection with this phrase. Is it something okay. that was invented after that when a lot of ex servicemen who were involved in the Falklands War mm. came back and were completely traumatized? And that that's when it to me it seems to have yeah. started. Obviously the, the condition was there way before that and we just talked about the, the after aftermath of the Second World War. But as a as a something with a name, mm-hmm. when did it start? Well, I think you're right in saying it's existed for a very long time. And certainly we know that PTSD used to be referred to as shell shock. And those people who are experiencing shell shock, some soldiers got some help by going to a hospital in Edinburgh, actually Craig Lockhart Hospital, which helped them by giving them tasks like gardening, getting them out into nature, getting them walking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but as as far as giving it a term, it was Vietnam, post Vietnam, that it was PTSD, um, post traumatic stress disorder. Um, and there's a there's a diagnostic manual that uh, we refer to as a psychologist, which is an American diagnostic manual. And so it breaks things down into categories. I don't particularly like the word disorder. Disorder is attached to a lot of things, you know, anxiety disorder and borderline personality disorder and um, post-traumatic stress disorder. You are living with something that is difficult. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you are disordered or not normal because you're experiencing it. But PTSD is defined quite clearly. It's, it's a clinical condition. So what, what I would do as a psychologist is somebody would be sitting in front of me and I work in the NHS for the Centre for Anxiety, Stress and Trauma. So I see emergency service workers who have experienced trauma in their work. Wow. So police officers, firefighters ambulance workers and the way you would see whether they have PTSD is you would give them a a questionnaire they go through the questionnaire if they have symptoms of avoidance intrusion which means they've got intrusive thoughts they might have nightmares flashbacks they might have physical symptoms they might be um, behaviorally they, they might be avoiding withdrawing from from normal activities so if they if they're ticking quite a lot of boxes then that might be symptomatic of PTSD and then you would test them a few months later to see if it exists because the the thing about post-traumatic stress disorder is that it can it can pop up any time after the the initial trauma it can either be one trauma you experienced or it can be a series of them and it might not happen then and there you know that typically veterans for example will ring combat stress which is a helpline mm. about 10 years yeah after the initial trauma do, do you think we throw this ptsd phrase around a little bit too easily I, I mean i've had lots of people being in on all sorts of different subjects and as, almost as a matter of fact in the middle of the conversation they just throw in oh and I, ian i suffer from ptsd and i'm thinking do you really I mean, given the seriousness that that phrase really implies, Mm. um, is it something that maybe, I mean, I know there are different degrees of PTSD, but should we be using it for something that is maybe comparatively trivial compared to what ex-soldiers suffer from? That's a really interesting question because I, I don't think it's up to us to tell people that they don't, that they're not experienced something mm. traumatic. Mm. Um, but but uh, trauma is only trauma if it's perceived to be traumatic by someone. So you and I might go through the same experience. I might find it traumatic. You may yeah. not. I mean, I'm thinking particularly here. I went through cancer and my brother-in-law went through cancer. He subsequently died because he had a terminal form of cancer. I was extremely lucky in that mine wasn't. I found my experience traumatic he didn't find his experience traumatic. And we talked about this mm. quite openly and freely. So I think the definition of trauma is a very individual one. There is the clinical definition, which I might use in clinic, which is PTSD, which is the scales and, and referring to the manuals, etc. And then there is, have I experienced something traumatic? 
Yes, I have. Well, who am I to say you haven't? And does it help you as a therapist or counsellor to have gone through something traumatic yourself? When, when I was with cancer patients, and as I say, I was with them for two years, um, a year in a charity, uh, Maggie's, which offers cancer support, and a year in uh, psycho-oncology at a London, big London hospital, um, none of my none of the people I came into contact with knew I'd had a cancer experience and it was important that they didn't know really because my stuff wasn't of interest to them and it's you you don't bring that stuff into the room because you are with them and you need to be fully present with them without your clutter Mm. Um, but I think in terms of understanding perhaps um, the, the 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 things that you can go through, just in the same way as sort of grief. You know, we've yeah. we've all experienced, especially if you're a certain age, <laughs> um, you, we've all experienced some kind of grief. And so, even though the experiences will be very different, and grief is very individual, and loss is very individual, you 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 can understand that feeling of of isolation. And sometimes desperation, sometimes feeling okay one minute, and then the next minute you feel dreadful, like you've well, been knocked that, off. Barry and Charlton has just texted in. Grief has hit me. My wife died last year, and I struggle to deal with it. Loneliness is the worst thing. Yeah, I'm really sorry, Barry, because that's that's new as well. That's new for you. Um, I mean, there is this sort of loss and alienation, especially if it's a partner. Um, and and you can often feel that that life becomes a bit meaningless mm. and although it's normal and grief and loss is normal sadly it is exhausting um and and barry there is no one way to do it but there is this the phrase that robert frost wrote about which is the only way out is through and you and you have to go through day by day moment by moment just putting one foot in front of the other remembering the person you've lost because I think that's really important to hold something of them with you and remember the good times as well because very often I think when we lose someone and if especially if we're with them for the last few weeks of life at, and because the brain holds on to negative so easily <laughs> and and holding on to positive is a much more difficult thing for the brain that that's the way our primal brain works we we respond to the negative is that you remember the 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 perhaps the last bits of life and i think it's really important to revisit the earlier bits and remember them mm. how they were and keep those routines going you know that you used to share i know they're not with you now but that is also a way of reflecting and, and remembering them. And getting through, yeah. it's not a betrayal no. of your wife to, no, to get through. No. Um, because I think everyone would want their partner to, I was going to say move on, I'm not quite sure that's the phrase, the, the right phrase, but to continue with a happy life. Mm-hmm. Yes. But you've got to want to do it. You've got to want to get through, haven't you, to, to make the first step to doing so. You have. And and it used to be that there were these stages of people thought there were stages of grief. You know, you go through denial and then you go through anger, you go through all these bit, 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 bit. Mm. And it's not like that. You know, it's it's messy and tangled up. And one minute you can feel I'm dealing with this fine. And then the next minute, something small, like a small kindness can offer floor you. Somebody just saying, you OK? Or is there anything I can do? I would say that other social support and social networks are really, really important when you're going through grief, even if you do not feel like it. Just connecting with somebody else yeah. and having somebody that that has your back, that who you can phone if you just want to hear a voice on the other end of the line. You know that that is crucial. I think. Now, we've got to interrupt this conversation because we're not like the BBC. We have to go to a commercial break. (laughs) Though you're used to that on Channel 5, I know. Um, But we are going to take your calls. Some cracking calls coming in already and some texts. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call if you'd like to talk to Dr. Sean Williams. It's 8.21 on LBC. This is LBC.
Dr Sean Williams is with me. We're about to take your calls. Calvin is a new caller in Manchester. Hello, Calvin. Hi. Uh, um, yeah, so I've, I've never called in uh, to a radio station in my life before, but um, a lot of the stuff you were discussing like resonated a lot. Um, so I, I lost my mother to cancer when, when I was 19, um, but she was ill from when I was about 11. So mm. I kind of like grew up with, you know, seeing her deteriorate and um, that was really tough for me so I I kind of moved on to you know like using substances and Mm -hmm. everything to kind of get through that um, stage of like seeing her deteriorate basically Um, and yeah like in like the last couple of weeks before she died she like took me aside and um, she also told me that um, the guy that I thought was my father um he couldn't have kids um and so basically i was a sperm donor with these other siblings basically on a piece of paper basically right. um so yeah no i like because it resonated with me before you know you mentioned yeah, about yeah. the david jason's um you know finding so, you know a so, daughter or so like, calvin so. The, the 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 person you thought was your father was not your father the person you'd grown up with um so I him him and uh, my mother got divorced when I was three, mm-hmm. um, and then um, I grew up with a stepfather. Right. Um, but I always, always kind of saw him as my father. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's yeah, a lot so to it's do. Been, with. Like very tough. Like, and mm-hmm. I know, like you were saying, um, it, you know, that grief is really messy and stuff. And I completely agree with that. Like, it's, it's not as easy as like. You know, you, you've got to want to get through it. Like some day, like I think you always want to get through it, um, but some days it's just so tough. And you know, like I'm. It's been like nine years now, and it's still like every day you don't know what to expect, really. Um, but I also wanted to say, like I'm, you know, I'm dealing with like mental health teams and stuff at the moment, and they've they've been amazing. Um, oh, good. But you always like. You, you you can always see like they they need more funding and like to get things done quicker and stuff like it would be amazing if they had more funding and support for that because yeah, wouldn't it yeah wouldn't it? These because they need are doing it an amazing job yeah uh, well I'm really glad that you're getting some kind of support are you getting yeah. regular support now Carol yeah yeah so I, I have like a phone call like every every month you okay. know like review and stuff. Um, but like you know, like the council, the, the NHS counselling um, waiting list, uh, it's crazy. Like they you are. have to be on there for months, um, and you know, I have gone private like a few times and stuff, but it's very expensive. Yes, um, yes, it is. And if you need to talk, to, like you know, like you were saying before, like you talking is so important. Like mm. that is really key for for people to get everything off their the shoulders. Um, it is. And it obviously, is. I can't, I can't like afford it at the moment. So, well, like, it's another avenue that I've not really got, you know. So, yeah, yeah. And I'm really sorry. I completely get the the frustration of needing support and not being able to access it yeah. as frequently as you'd like. Because it's great to have that review with your mental health yeah. team every month, but it's clearly not enough for you if, if yeah. nine years after I your think mother's for a death, lot of people still... as well. You yeah, know. yeah, indeed. And we know that that you know that there are waiting lists, and it it actually it depends where you are in the country as well. Where where do you live okay. at the moment, Calvin? I'm I'm in Manchester. Okay, right. So we know that some areas like Manchester, Liverpool, you've got to wait longer before you're referred to an NHS psychologist. I mean, you know, in some areas you can get referred within three days. I know there's a particular area in South Sefton in Merseyside where you've got to wait 229 days before you're referred. So we know there are inequalities, postcode inequalities across the UK. Uh, in terms of NHS support. Um, A couple of things. Firstly, I would say, if you need to talk, I don't know whether you've contacted Crew's Bereavement Support. They are brilliant. And and that that sort of helpline, Samaritans is another one. Yeah, yeah. Even if you think, well, I won't ring the Samaritans because I'm not at that stage, if that makes sense. If you want somebody on the end of a line who's trained to listen and just hold you for that time when you're when you're struggling, 
then then course, that can yeah. be a, a really important thing to do. Do you have do you have support around you? Do you have a good network yeah, of friends and yeah, family? No, I, I do, I do. But like you know, some days you just like just want to be shut off from the whole world, yeah, don't you? And like yeah. you just don't even want to. Yeah. I don't know. You just don't. You don't feel worthy of the support, and you just want to kind of like give up on everything. But yeah. But yeah. It, you, you know, know what? It, I, and I think it's it's really hard, isn't it? Because when you're at your lowest, you don't want to yeah. go out and talk to people. But when you're at your lowest, that's the most important time yeah. when when you should. And and we know that talking Definitely. to people, sharing problems, getting out into nature, going for a walk taking a just a deep breath in nature whatever it is that can just support you in that moment in that day do that and 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 work out what your good coping strategies are you know what works for you and i hear you saying it's been a long time and you've wanted to almost shut yourself away and withdraw perhaps and avoid life rather than get involved but if 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 there is a way of tentatively taking some steps with somebody you trust, then then that might help. Calvin, thank you very much thank indeed you. for Thanks, your Calvin. call. Uh, we're going to take more of your calls with Sean. She's here until 9 o'clock, 0345 6060 973. And we're mainly talking about trauma, PTSD, anxiety and grief. It's half past eight. Let's get the news headlines on LBC with Daryl Jackson. A mother of a nine-year-old girl cried in court as a man was found guilty of her murder. Thomas Cashman shot Olivia Pratt Corbell in her home in Liverpool last August as he was chasing a drug dealer. Three people had been arrested after a father and son were shot dead in Cambridgeshire. They were killed six miles apart and police say it may have been over a custody dispute. And 10 days of strikes by security guards at Heathrow Airport are going ahead tomorrow. Talks failed to resolve around overpay. Around 1,400 members of the Unite Union are walking out, which could mean delays and disruption for passengers. LBC weather, blustery rain across Wales and southern and central England this evening. Drier further north and windy in the south, a low of four degrees. This is LBC.
Four, Danny in Camberley just made us laugh with this text. He says, tonight's subject on PTSD and the lady on the radio with old what's his name, thank you, is fantastic and I can't stop listening in my car and my Indian takeaway is getting cold, but that's not important. Oh, bless you. Thank you. That's so nice. How right. are you, old what's his name? Are you all right? I'm very well, thank you. All Good. the better for having you with me. Right, let's go to Delroy in Brixton. Hi, Delroy. Hi, Hi Ian. Ian, I'm your age, by the way, so if that gives an idea of where, partly where <laughs> I'm coming from. Uh, thank you, Sean, for bringing this subject. I'd like to introduce and inform the debate. The debate. Um, some of your listeners may know, because I mentioned it a few times, I'm uh, registered blind and I lost my sight. And the, the, the PTSD associated with sight loss, Ian and Sean, is, is quite staggering, I have to say. I'm kind of over the worst of it, but you never, ever, if you, unlike Stevie Wonder, who I believe was born with a sight vision, when you actually have had sight and then you lose it and your whole mm. life chances, your lived experience, Experience changes beyond all you can you, it just the whole thing caves in on you no matter how much you look at the glass half full rather than the half empty scenario which you have to use all sorts of coping strategies you never really it's like a sense of loss of bereavement that you've lost the old you it's horrible yeah, it is yeah, horrible yeah when when did you lose your sight Delroy well it finally went in 2015 what the particular condition I've got is a congenital one it's hereditary from a mother from a grandmother so it's come down through the generations sadly right. and my brother's got it my mother's got it. so we were kind of pre-prepared in what we, we saw our family members degrading as the decades went by so we thought this is what's going to be so you know you right. have to deal with that yeah so i it went it's called retinitis pigmentosa those who are interested in what it is it's a, it's a regressive obviously progressive but you lose your sight and you, your retina starts to malfunction and the cells die over you over the decades so you have night blindness as a child so i definitely had ptsd or child cptsd as they call it where i used to go out in the dark couldn't play with my friends or anything because everything just went black as soon as i went as soon as it got to dusk child it was just pff, Nothing. You couldn't mm. see people's faces. It, that sense of uh, despondency and being detached from what was going yes, on. Yes. And I finally lost my sight as, you, as the periphery disappears in your 20s and 30s. And you, you realise the race is on. And I really had to get back to college, get the degrees in quick, whilst I could still read papers. And I had sight aids and visual aids and magnifiers. And eventually in my mid-30s, it started, I got registered blind. It was too late, really. And the whole thing was just like a downward spiral. And of course, you kind of realise that everyone at some point, we don't all go forever. Well, that's fine. But when you kind of, your sight, the, your life chances are kind of yanked from under, the, the mats yanked from under your whilst you could do so much and yet you can't, you know you'll never get, I'll never drive a car, I'll never feel what that, the wind in your hair, you never feel all those things. And I'm not the only one, there's loads of people like us. And the point is, is that I've come to terms with it in the sense that, you know, we all gonna got to go sometimes, you've got to you know, make the best of what you've got, no matter how bleak it may seem, you have to just come back to that position. But, you know, it's, it's never great and yet you always have to, it's every day you open your eyes and go, oh God, not another one of this fuzzy, you know, just a cloud of light. It's like going up to the clouds in an aeroplane and be constantly inside the clouds and like stumbling around and having to rely on other people is the worst thing. Is you can't go out because you have to hold someone's elbow. You know, no matter how much white cane training, you'll always end up banging your knee on bollards and street furniture. It's just you know the amount of bruises I've got on my forehead here, and you wouldn't believe. You know, for just trying to do what Sean said, yeah. get out there and live your life. Yeah, it's yeah, so no. Hard. I... I mean, what you're saying, there has been so much as well that that you have been living with, knowing yeah. that your sight was going. And yeah. that, that threat of something yes. being taken away from you and your yes. identity being threatened Absolutely. all the way through your life because you've seen what, what has happened to yeah. other people. And, yeah. and I, I imagine, I mean, I'm, I might be wrong, tell me if I am, mm -hmm. um, but, but that sense of being quite vigilant, hypervigilant, always being aware, oh, what constantly. can I see today? Well, it's, it's a today. life and death. It's like fight. You're constantly adrenalised because right. you fight or flight. Not the fight, fight or bit, flight. but the fight. Yes. You're thinking, oh no, my God. I, and you I get to the point it. where you want to wrap yourself in cotton wool because you think, well, I've cut my hand yeah. to throw open a can yesterday. I don't want to be doing that again. And yet you have, you have all to eat. And you try and, they try and encourage you to do what they call independent living when you get disability benefit and you're living mm. on your own post divorce like myself. Mm. And you try to do your bet for, so that you're not reliant on anybody because there's nothing wrong with the brain. It's just your retinas that don't. Everything else works perfectly well. But if you go out there like I did just after the lockdown, I thought, right, I'm determined to get out now after this damn lockdown and I went walked down the street with my white cane and I walked into a fence and I heard a woman's voice behind me turned around I was right in the middle of the road I walked straight and the car was up my backside and a little child got me out the way and said where do you live and I said I live on such and such and they took me home and I, I opened my front door I sat down I thought bloody hell I can't even do this anymore yeah Sean. there's that frustration <gasps> yeah yeah because you're having to relearn how to live yes. but you're also yes. having to relearn who you are that's it if that had been me, yeah. I'd have walked through th the front door, sat on the couch and cried my eyes out.
But that's mm. kind of what, what the thing is, Ian, I thought, I can, how do I take this? Well, I can either do one of two things, do what you said, but I think I did that when I first lost my sight yeah. completely anyway. But afterwards, you just think, well, when I stop crying, what do I then do? Then I've got to just get up off my backside and go and make the tea da, da, yeah. da, da, and just get on with it. You have to, no matter how bleak it is, because yeah. and no one's going to come in and you're, say, come You're on, incredibly mate. positive. And, and well, very resilient. Honestly, I hear that with you, Delroy, because you're, it's you're, you are getting... John. It's yeah. just frustrating, yeah. yeah. no, you could do, yes. but you can't. But it's like you're being, you've got a pair of sort of psychological handcuffs that's been imposed on you mm. and you think, well, how can I get these damn things off and make my life as f- fulfilled and quality to this? You see, yeah. I, I, it's really interesting hear, hearing from you because I know wh- whenever we talk about disability, I often get lots of calls from people who are registered blind, but mm. you can actually take your experience through a lot of other disabilities where one bit of your brain or one bit of your body doesn't work doesn't properly, work. but that doesn't mean that society should write you off and it must be so frustrating. Yes, yeah. I used to work with people with um, adult hearing loss and and it was similar, that that, that sense of sudden isolation, you know, of, of being one person then all of a sudden having to relearn who you mm. are and how you exist and, and how you negotiate the outside world. Mm. And you're right, we should be a lot more aware um, in order to provide provision and, and be helpful when when this happens because it's it's difficult so but but Delroy you know I applaud you getting up and, and love, going out I just and, love hearing the positivity yeah and controlling what you can yeah, I'm going to do what exactly. I can and every day I'm going to I'm going to try again thank you very much Good let's luck. go to Kieran in Hearn Bay in Kent hello Kieran hello, hi Kieran how are you? hi, hi. Um, I had to phone in I've been been on the phone before when I was looking after my mum and dad for the last uh, well they, they, my mum passed away nearly two years ago now um, but I was looking after them on and off for 12 years before that. But once they've gone, and something Sean said about the positive, because I was actually going to go to Ireland with my ex-girlfriend last September, and I cancelled it because I went to Ireland my mum and dad had a house over there years ago in the 70s, and we used to go to various beaches. But I just felt that I'd be remembering the negative things that happened, like when I put my knee through the window and nearly fell out the window, and mm-hmm. <laughs> rather than... The positive, positive. yeah. It and takes it takes an additional life, effort, Kieran. That's why the brain. It's like it's like we have to override our natural instinct because the 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 reason the brain goes to the negative is like a survival instinct. So that so the reason it will bring you know sometimes we we have difficult memories or sometimes you might be thinking I'm not going to go near that window because of what happened. Is it your brain trying to protect you? But the only thing is, if it's on all the time, if that alert system, that alarm is on all the time, then it's sort of suppressing the positivity. It's suppressing any of the joy that you can get. And it also affects the way you can think rationally. So so it's, I think, a, a really important thing if that alarm is going off is just notice it and and create a bit of a pause where you can take a breath and go... Okay, well, I know that's what my brain is doing. doing that tonight, actually, actually, because I'm trying to sort my house out, mm-hmm. and I just couldn't be bothered. Right. And I said, I've just met a girlfriend that works in the social services, and uh, she's all for helping me sort my life out. Mm-hmm. And I thought, God, I'm going to have to do, do something. And I got up and put the radio on, and there you are. You used to uh-huh. watch on Breakfast TV. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I really appreciate you, you ringing in today. I, I do. Thank you very much. Good luck with sorting thanks, your house thanks. out. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Th- thank you, Kieran. Thanks, Kieran. Uh, right, let's go to Matt, who's a new caller in Exeter. Hello, Matt. Hi, well, Matt. Hi, guys. Yeah, thanks for taking my call. Yeah, essentially, the situation I'm going through at the moment is about nearly four years ago, um, <clears throat> I tried to access my two children off my ex-partner. Um, she has basically used all the tactics possible to prevent that, Um, And she's accused me of essentially everything you can possibly imagine, ranging from rape to, you know, horrible things on my children. Um, I was arrested in 2021, and I've been going through the uh, process of this case since then. Um, I'm due to go to Crown Court in in August, but obviously all these 14 allegations I've got against me are all false allegations. There's no evidence for any of them. Matt, um, so I'm, I'm going to stop you there because I think if this is going to court, I'm not wholly sure that we can really be talking about this on the on the radio. I hope I hope you don't mind. I mean, why why don't we just sort of leave? Well, the, I, I, won't, I won't go into detail. If that's all right. I'll just, I'll just give an overview of it. But I, I think with the situation, it's it's not just myself who's going through this, and unfortunately, this is the real flip side of the, the Me Too movement. 
um, in that I understand that people are trying to do what they can now for, for women's rights, and I, and I wholeheartedly agree with that. But the problem is it, it's taking situations like mine, whereas before they wouldn't necessarily have any evidence and, and they, they'd drop it then and there. The government are pushing these cases through now purely to up their statistics to say, you know, we're doing, okay. well, we're doing this. I, I'm kind of assuming that you are, oh, this is a very stressful situation, mm. whatever the rights and wrongs of it, you're having to cope with that. Mm. I mean, Sean, yeah. someone in, in Matt's situation, how do, how do you deal with the stress of, I mean, you've got this looming date and whatever happens in that, it will change your life for good or ill. I mean, yeah. how do you cope with that? Well, without going to the ins and outs, because as Ian said, if 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 something like if a case is is active at the moment and going to Crown Court, then then we can't we we can't discuss any of the details of that case, obviously. But but I think in what what we hear you saying is that at the moment you are in a state of acute stress that you're finding it really difficult to to manage because of the impact as well, effectively, on on other people as well as yourself. Um, and and if you're living in a state of acute stress, uh, the first thing to do is to appreciate because if this this date is is coming up in the distance, is is it's about trying to live with the uncertainty, which is really really hard. But that means just doing doing it on a day to day basis and living on a day to day basis and and trying not to catastrophize. So trying not to sort of ruminate and have lots of brooding, depressing, ruminating thoughts that just go round and round and round and round or trying not to catastrophize and look at the what ifs, but just stay in the present moment, deal with the present day and just get on with life today and tomorrow will be tomorrow. Matt, thank you very much for calling in. Um, it's not only Danny who's sitting in his car tonight. Um, With his takeaway. This is somebody else saying, sitting in my car listening to Dr. Sean Williams, I could listen to her all night. She totally gets it. Oh, thank That's you very much. That's a good compliment, much. isn't That's it? That's lovely. i that. Yeah, yeah. It's I eight, will take that. 8.46. LBC.
is the time. Um, someone's tweeted here, sorry, texted, how do you get over a narcissistic relationship? I am destroyed. What is a nar- Is that a c- conventional it, term? Well, uh, n- living with a narcissist is extremely difficult. So to your text. Uh, as my, my partner would say, yeah. <laughs> um, are you manipulative? No, I don't think so. Okay. Do you, often um, narcissistic... Uh, personalities are distinguished by that sort of manipulative thinking, lack of empathy. Um, so it it can be, and and not only manipulative and lack of empathy, but also if you're living with somebody like that, it can be quite hard to know at any given moment which way mm. they're going to go. But the relationship's clearly ended. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, so it'll I, be the, I don't know what the effects, the after effects of that, relationship were but there might be something to do with trust i would yeah. say learning to trust learning to reconnect because th- they may be in quite a vulnerable state and and the the word vulnerable has a, a greek origin and that origin is wound and you and it's it's like having an open wound that's why it's so frightening to be vulnerable and if you've been with somebody who's narcissistic you can feel extremely on edge and extremely vulnerable at the same time. And that's a very threatening place to be. So you can always be on high alert and also feel very wounded at the same time. So, and there can be after effects even when that relationship is, is over. So, I mean, I was going to say, well, you're out of it. You've got to treat the future as an opportunity rather than a threat. But it's easy, it's easy to say that without knowing the circumstances. Yes, and I think it's important to remember that sometimes our experiences can almost shift the way our brain works. So, And we've heard, haven't we, throughout this hour, people who've had past experiences that are still playing into their present. Mm. So in other words, even though there might have been years past, it still feels now as though they're in quite a dark place. And, and so what it's, what it's about is understanding that, noticing that, noticing what thoughts come up. So what thoughts come up when this person thinks about the previous relationship or about themselves in that relationship? What thoughts come up for you? Where do you hold it in your body? That's a really important thing because a lot of us live in our heads and we don't pay attention to how our body and our brain kind of match up. And, and if, you, if you pay attention to where you're holding anxiety or threat or worry or any of that stuff, you might find it's in your stomach and it feels really hard and jagged in your stomach. Some people find it in their chest. They might be breathing quite erratically or, or very, very shallow, very high breathing. So just notice what's going on. Slow things down a little bit. Take a breath and show yourself some self-compassion. Just take sm- each day at a time and small achievable steps and goals. Someone else just texted in on this saying, um, that is exactly how I feel. My brain is not the same. Three years, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Um, someone's cor- Sandra's trying to correct you saying it's Latin, not Greek. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't study classics. Is that Sandra? Thank we you. We need Jacob rees here, don't we, really? <laughs> oh, Said dear. no one ever. No, no, I'm, I'm, honestly, I'm really open to being corrected. Thank you. Right, let's go Off to Jack wrong. in Hayward's Heath. Hello, Jack. Hi, Jack. Uh, good evening, you two. Nice to speet you. Hi. And you. Um, bear with me. I haven't spoken about this before. Okay. Ten, ten years ago, my father died on Father's Day. And I I was the one that received the phone call from the police. Mm-hmm. Um, and because of the line of work I was in, I had to go and identify his body and deal with all of the funeral arrangements afterwards. And I've never spoken about it. I've just got on with it. And only now I've uh, I've got a son. And he keeps asking about his granddad. Mm. And I don't know what to say. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough. That is tough. Oh, sorry. No, 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 please don't apologise. I mean, you say, it's, you say you haven't spoken about it. Have you not spoken about it with anyone, Jack? No. OK. I just got on with it and looked after my family, like... Yeah. Like, I should have done it. Yeah, yeah. That's, but that's a... That's a big loss and a big responsibility for you as well. And and on Father's Day, that even though it's ten years ago, there's there's that reminder, isn't there? 
um, which which must be quite difficult. Um, can, can I ask? And you don't have to answer this. Was it was it an accident? Was it? Was um, he had a. Thankfully, he had a blood clot that went oh, to his heart. Okay. Okay. He was, he was gone before he knew what was happening. So it was very sudden. Yeah. 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 And and do you think? I mean, are you going back and remembering the no. identification, or are you remembering what happened beforehand, or what what's troubling you at the moment? Uh, the fact that I've the fact I've forgotten him because I don't talk about him. I can't right. remember what he looks like. Yeah. Do you have pictures of him? No. Okay. Well, not not I don't, but I'm sure my my mum doesn't. But I don't don't look at them. And yeah. Do you have just, Do you have any good memories of your dad? Do you, yes. Do you? Okay. Can you tell yeah. me Can you tell me one of those? Uh, the conversation I had with him the day he died. Okay. Um. Obviously, it was Father's Day. Mm-hmm. Uh, he uh, he just left hospital because he had his leg amputated because right. he had diabetes, mm-hmm. and he just left Roehampton, where he'd got his prosthetic fitted, and we'd made an arrangement to walk <laughs> to walk to the pub that night mm-hmm. and have a drink to celebrate. Mm-hmm. I'm still waiting for that day. Yeah. I think it's really important, Jack, if you can, to find somebody that you can trust to talk to. Do you have a Do you have a partner or a friend that you can yeah. talk to? Because you've been holding on to this for a long time, and it's obviously still feels very raw. I'm very present, and I get what you're saying as well about your little boy who's asking about his granddad. And I wonder whether for for him you might be able to just think of some of the time, some of the earlier times you had with with your dad that you can share with him. You don't you don't have to tell him everything about what happened, and and you don't have to tell him even what you're experiencing at the moment. But but it might be helpful for you to remember the. The good times with your dad, but cruise bereavement support. I was just going to say because uh, Jack, my my look, I'm not a professional in this, but from what you're saying, I think you should be speaking to a grief counsellor. Yeah, definitely. I think it. W- I think it would really help. I'm going to give you a number. Do you have a pen with you? Yes. Okay. Yes. Can you write down this number? This is cruise. This is cruise bereavement support, and um, they'll be open tomorrow during the day. Um, yep. This is their number, and they are absolute specialists in this, Jack, so they will be able to help. It's 0808... 0808... 808... 1677. So that's 0808... 808... 1677. And if you need to speak to somebody before that, because if you said this stuff out loud for the first time which is an incredibly courageous thing to do. And can I applaud you for doing that, Jack, because that's a big old thing to ring in and speak to a stranger. If you think it's helpful saying things out loud and acknowledging the difficulty and the grief, then call the Samaritans because they they will also help you and they're on 116123. Jack. Jack, I know it's been very emotional for you, but but thank you very thank much you indeed so for much. sharing your story with us because there'll be a lot of people listening. You're not the only one in this situation. There'll be a lot of people listening who can really identify with what you've been through. Mm-hmm. Thank, thank you so much. Um, we could go on for another three hours, frankly, couldn't we? We could. Because um, there's, there's so many people that I think do feel the need to talk to somebody. And, I mean, what Jack has done, phoning two complete strangers yeah. on the radio, you might think is, a, is an odd thing to do, given that he hasn't talked to anyone else for, for 10 years. Okay. But I think it's a testament to the the trust that he would have in you and hopefully me on this programme. Mm-hmm. And hopefully we've given him, or you've given him, some really good advice there and he'll take you up on that tomorrow. Well, thank you for offering people the opportunity and thanks to everyone who's who's called and, and texted. Thank you. <laughs> 
Let's do it again sometime. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's Dr. Sean Williams. And by the way, you can listen to our podcast, which we only recorded last week. It'll be out next Wednesday on the Ian Dale All Talk podcast. Subscribe now, so make sure you don't miss it. Coming up in the next hour, Rishi Sunak has promised schools will receive guidance on policies for transgender pupils for the summer term. He intervened after a teaching union said its members were navigating a minefield around gender. He was asked about a report from the centre-right think tank Policy Exchange, which looked at 154 English secondary schools. It found only 39 of them reliably informed parents when pupils identified as trans or questioned their gender. I find that astonishing. I don't know whether you do too. This is an absolute minefield. We're going to pick our way through it over the next hour. How would you feel as a parent if your if your child's school allowed them to ID themselves without your knowledge? On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, a man has been found guilty of murdering nine-year-old Olivia pratt Corbell at her home in Liverpool. 34-year-old Thomas Cashman shot the schoolgirl in August last year while chasing a drug dealer. Well, LBC's Liam Gotti.